Hey folks, and welcome to North of Chaos. I am your iconic ginger host, James Wolf. Today, I had a chat with a great friend of mine who I'd like to see a lot more, Jess Wise. She's a fellow redhead. She is a serial entrepreneur and a deep student of ethical non-monogamy. And we talked a lot about sexuality. We talked a lot about non-monogamy. We talked a lot about intimacy and romance. She put me on the hot seat pretty intensely and made me reevaluate how I view friendships in general. Am I just romantically interested in everyone I'm friends with? I have no idea. I'm still contemplating. But anyway, we're going to dive in. But before we do, make sure you like, follow, share, hit the little ringy bell thingy uh, to make sure this conversation just gets out there, right? We got a YouTube channel, we got Spotify, we're on all the other podcast platforms. I'm really excited about this. This was probably one of my favorite conversations so far. It may have even been my favorite one. I don't know. And I'm excited for you to listen and watch. So let's dive in. And I love it. Oh, great. I love it. Yeah. I just see a general visual. I, I think I'm seeing a shaved side head, which I kind of love. Yeah, it's it's a little long right now, but yes, I yeah? do have a I do have a side cut. Yeah. I love that. When did you when did you do that? Um, right before the pandemic. So basically the worst time because I was like, okay, I'm gonna try to present more queer i've wanted a side cut for as long as i can remember but um i think i did it maybe january or february and then the pandemic hit and so then of course i was not able to yeah. show it off for like two years no <laughs> no i mean i yeah. did the opposite i grew out all this crap on my face yeah and i've never been a mustache <laughs> guy ever so i can't imagine it <laughs> i no one could and i i just remember i, I just got out of a relationship too and I was kind of messing around and I intentionally kept growing this out and shaving this. So I had a pretty sizable <laughs> mustache and I, you know, I kind of have a big mouth as it is. Like I have a big lips yeah. and I'm starting to realize that the big lipped gents kind of look a little silly with the mustache because it's just so much going on. Everyone I've seen it almost with gives it, it like a lip, like a yeah, it's, it's, jump. it's yeah. even more, it's even more. And so I, I posted yeah. it a little bit as a joke on Bumble back then. And so many people were so into it and it was a was little say, surprising. I was a little, I was, I don't know what's behind that. So wait, was it just mustache or was it beard too? Cause that's it really was, an important distinction. You can kind of see this, right? You can kind of see that, right? Yeah. It's not. Yeah. I had this and then I had a mustache that went to like, you know, like where you can kind of see where it goes. Yeah, it was like <laughs> way more though. And it was it was cool. I had fun with it. It lasted all of four hours <laughs> when I did it because I had it all going. Yeah. And then yeah. I, I cut all this off. I just wanted to see. Yeah, I don't know. Are you into that? But So the, so Bumble was really was really was a fan for, me. for the women. Yeah, Bumble loved it. Bumble loved it. Women, yeah. I think, who really wanted their... 80s porn fantasy experience were really do you think it? it's because it makes you look more interesting because you're you're very pretty right so i'm like i'm wondering if the mustache like made you look because you are interesting but like maybe it made <laughs> i'll just you say am i so bland looking in my <laughs> no. prettiness holy <laughs> sh <laughs> holy do you know what i mean like it, like I there's do. like quirkiness maybe you're like more approachable like what do you, why do you think people liked it so much <laughs> what do what do we think about that is is the the prettiness unapproachable in life? Is that a thing? Oh, totally. Yeah. I mean, yeah. I only know from the guy to girl way, and I can 100% say that's a thing. I don't know what it's like the other way around. Um, so I've actually been studying a lot of attraction stuff. So I can tell cool. you that Bring it on. Um, there's this really fascinating phenomenon where most people date within what they consider to be like a point above or below their mm. attractiveness level. And most mm. people kind of know where they objectively fall, which is really bizarre that we kind of know like, okay, if we were to ask a random person where we fall on the totem pole, um, I think men actually overestimate and women underestimate, which feels like just a consistent is that a thing personal, in life. <laughs> is that a personal anecdotal experience? Because I my personal um, anecdotal experience of that is the other way around. 
Interesting. More men, you I feel, women... underplay and women overplay there. And I, I am wondering. Let's 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 dive into this. This is very fascinating. Well, okay, do, so yeah, where keep do you going. Think, where would where would you put yourself on this on this number oh, scale? Oh God, I see the videos of this, and I'm just thinking like, oh God, I don't want to. But here we are. We're doing it. We're just not on TikTok. Yeah. Amazing. Yeah. Um, I <laughs> and I also come, you know I come from a place for you know at this point a little bit still more than half of my life of not getting any attention. I was not a good looking kid growing up until. I mean, I was a like virgin till pretty pretty into my life, and I would say I started getting pretty good attention when I was twenty one and up. So interesting. And, so you so yeah. were you like actually awkward looking, or were you? Did you just no, feel I awkward? Just, my you face actually... just no. I was nothing about me it was awkward. I I still was this goofy dude, but I just my face didn't like you know I didn't have like a chin yet. I, I like baby you know I had all the baby stuff. And uh, so it took you until 21 to like really grow into your body. Yes. Kind of. Yes. Okay. Yes. And then it okay. took like three years for me to even believe that the compliments and the attention I was getting was genuine. Yeah. And that's another whole thing. Right. Because I'm like, okay, well, I know the experience I've had for 21 years and this is not it. So I kept thinking like it wasn't real. Does that make sense? Totally. I so maybe this is less of a gendered thing then, and it's more of a were you an awkward kid growing up or were you a hot kid growing up? And if you were a hot kid, then you just, you know what I mean? Because like I felt I, like yeah. I was kind of I was gangly and weird looking, and then all of a sudden I hit my twenties and I was getting a lot of attention, and it was very strange. Va -boom, va -boom. I was like, yeah, it was like I grew yeah. into my curves, I you know totally. all the things, but I I don't know. It was it was a weird. I still in my head I'm like, oh yeah, like I. You have a sister, you know, right? I do have a sister. Yeah. And what? So what was what was that dynamic like? Were you the gangly, not attractive one, and she was, or like what? What was that dynamic like? Oh, interesting. Um, well, she's much younger, so she's like eleven years younger. Oh, um, wow. Okay. And I would say that I wouldn't say that she was awkward. I think she and I had very different experiences because like I think I, I'm very cool <laughs> and so when I was I you know like starting yeah. in middle school I always had the hot friends that all the guys wanted to date and okay. in my head I was like oh like these guys want to date me eventually like what would happen is they would come and talk to me about their feelings for my friends we would develop a relationship because of course back then like boys didn't actually talk to their real crushes right. um and then because we were friends the guys would end up kind of being into me eventually um mm. and so it was okay. this kind of weird thing where in my head i was like i'm just like the cool chick you know i'm the one right. that's like really fun that people can talk to um and that's just in my head still who i am and i think with my sister she did get a lot more attention at a much younger age um and i think that was uh it was interesting to watch in like yeah. a really fascinating way. I want you to come but up. Yes. All right. So I, I had a whole thing with a friend about the word interesting. It almost means, it, does, it never means anything. The word That's interesting. That's why I love it. It's, it's like a very, you can project onto it what you want. You know, it's, it's a very, it's a very like milk toast. I know. It's how you're, you're putting all the pressure on me to, to try to figure out what you think about it when you say yeah. interesting. So what yeah, do fair. you actually feel about it? Um, well, I think, I think I was worried about, cause I think when, in my twenties, I got a lot of unwanted attention from men totally. that really impacted my career in a lot of ways, um, and how I existed in the world and all the things. And so for my sister, I just really wanted to impart wisdom. Cause I didn't really feel like I had somebody guiding me through how to navigate that. Yeah. Um, and so with her, when it was very obvious that she was getting a lot of attention, especially from older men, even when she was a teenager, just kind of saying like, here's how you set up boundaries. Here's how you make sure that you're safe. Um, Cause ultimately yeah. I just wanted her to feel comfortable in her body and like standing up for herself while also not making herself smaller. Cause there was a period of time where mm. like when I was in school and college, um, I went to a, well, several colleges, but one of them was a trade school and I was one of five women out of a class of like 90 students. Um, mm. and I felt really uncomfortable, um, taking up space. So I would like wear like really baggy clothes and hoodies oh. all the time. Um, oh. because I was like, I want people to take me seriously. <laughs> um, yeah. 
And I didn't want her to feel that way. It was like, no, I want you to feel in your body and like celebrate it because we're only young once. And I wish I had done more to celebrate my body and like show it off back when I was younger. Mm -hmm. Don't we all at this age? Um, But with her, it was like, yeah, like how do you take up space, feel confident in your body, show it off, but also make sure that you're setting boundaries and communicating them to people so that you're not getting the ick. (laughs) It's a real, it's a real interesting, uh, interesting. There we go. It's a very difficult needle to thread i think <laughs> do you have to it deal is. with that though because i think you're you're also very out in the world and and i'm sure you get a lot of attention and navigating how to get how to parse through i don't know how to parse that out of good attention versus unwanted attention and how do you celebrate your body and how you feel in your body while also not attracting the stuff you don't want <laughs> yes navigating how i physically show up in a world that kind of bounces sexualizing and not is a very mm-hmm. weird thing. It's a very weird thing. And, you know, as a guy, it's obviously so different than Do you like being woman. sexualized? No. I like here's I like attention. I don't like predatory attention. So what's, when I first what's the difference? Came, or how do you distinguish right, between the two? Right. <laughs> It's it's very similar to the idea of fame, let's say, right? Like there's fame for what you look like and there's fame for what you do. And mm-hmm. those are two, you know, you get the Einstein and you have, you know, Brad Pitt, right? And, uh, you know, I don't know, that's a great example, but I, it came out of my mouth there. And with this, you know, when I first moved out here, I think it was around when you and I first met, I was, you know, I, I played school in college. I understood biomechanics. And I was like, okay, I'm going to make a little extra money on the side. And I was a trainer at the Equinox in WeHo, which we. <laughs> is gay Mecca. It's gay Mecca. I didn't even yeah. know how much of gay Mecca it was until I started working there. And that was my first real experience getting repeatedly sexualized like all day where it was uncomfortable to walk around in this in this building and the all, the all, and they do something. So they don't give you clients. You have to walk the floor like, you know, a 1980s prostitute in New York city. And you just have to make eye contact <laughs> with everybody. You have to, you know, you're flirting and you're doing, and everyone's fit. So you're already going through this weird, like, why am I even doing this? Like no one needs personal training. So I have to literally <laughs> prostitute myself out to even get a client. And I, I don't know who the gentleman was, but, Someone came up to me one day and uh, he said, you know, none of us need personal training. As you can see, everyone's very fit, but we just like to pay to be around you. And I'm like, oh, man, that's, At least that's he was really honest what about it was. It. At least he was honest about it, but it wasn't a bit of honesty that I don't think was readily apparent. And it was such a wild little microcosm of experience with exactly what we're talking about, because all mm-hmm. the cardio machines were facing this one walkway. That you would walk back and you would just feel the eyes on you the whole time as you walk. And they gave you these baby blue shirts to signify that you were new. So you couldn't like escape the fact that you were just as fresh meat. You were fresh meat. So, uh, you know, it, it was a wild time. And even, you know, I, I quit after like a month because I, in that, I love the steam room. I, I To me, the locker room is the most asexual place on the planet. Like in theory, it right. should be. Because right. it is so vulnerable, everyone is nude. It's not supposed to be, you know, but that's actually the place where so much stuff happens because it's a great testing ground because so much happens, even in a very right. hetero world, that's totally acceptable in a locker room because of the vulnerability that's there. So it's a great place for people who are not hetero to kind of test how someone's feeling because they know they can't like say something too soon, they can't react because nothing's inappropriate yet, but you kind of know. So I was masturbated to three times in the first month of me being there in the steam room. But there's this whole process that happens up to it that I can't say anything about because they're not doing anything weird yet, but I know they're interested. And then in that moment of them doing that very inappropriate thing, you just, then you have the full full reign to react and be like, what do you do? So yeah, it was a, 
So were you it was polite a weird about thing. it? Did you just get up and like leave, or were you like, "What are you no, doing?" No, because no, because this? you can tell they're testing. You can tell they're testing until yeah. you know, and then they then they pull out you know the big guns, and then they're they're you know, I'd be like, "What the f are you doing?" And it was the same thing. They mm -hmm. all, each time, all three guys would giggle, get up, and leave. It was it was just like a test. It was just to see because so I guess people do respond favorably in some cases, or that wouldn't be happening. Is that, you know, I think I don't know. every straight that... man should be hit on by gay men so that they understand what it's like being <laughs> a woman. <laughs> it's so I'm so comfortable now. So kind of to answer your question, yeah. I'm so comfortable in my own being that I don't mind the hit on. I don't mind that like engagement at all. I think in the beginning when I was like 21, it was really yeah. weird and, and I didn't know. But now it's like, all right, you know, I'll put my arm around you and say, like, all right, you know, you can think in some world. Not here that it might happen, but you know, again, I don't know. Do you like so? Do you like the attention ever, or is is there ever a situation where you like being sexualized outside of obviously like intimate encounters where that's the intention, or is it something that Ooh. you're just always like, please don't sexualize me ever? <laughs> no, I bring it on. I bring it on. We're we're yeah. we're creatures of you know existential spiritualism and primal human nature, so we are animals mm -hmm. too. So. Yeah, to, to go through life and not know how people think of you in that way. Uh, yeah, I would rather, I guess if you have to compare it, I would rather that way than the other way. I would rather... Not being hit on. Yeah, or to be thought of as someone not, you know, deserve, not everyone's deserving, but uh, to be someone that isn't seen that way. I would much rather be seen as someone as, that is desirable. Because then it just becomes how you handle that that attention it's not really right you know and that's another whole thing too with, with cat calling and all of that that i'm curious about your perspective on and you know the general female population it's like is it terrible that's happening or is it not is it something that can be just handled and addressed by you and that's what the focus should be i'm not saying it's good that it happens but it's going to happen so what like what do you do then well i think that there's ways to give attention. I, I think the issue with a lot of um, how men give attention unwanted or un yeah. asked for attention is totally. um, they don't always understand the power dynamics or maybe they do. And maybe that's worse, but I think that there's yeah. a huge, you know, there's good reason for a lot of women to be afraid of men, right? And mm -hmm. and a cat call by itself might be really flattering if we knew and trusted that that's where it would stop. I think right. the challenge is we don't always know that that's where it's going to stop because most of us have had experiences where that's not where it stops. And so those things start to become almost warning signs of like, is this guy going to follow you home? Are you going to have to take mm. a different route? Like all these things that are going through your head where you can't enjoy the attention just for the attention. Totally. Um, so, you know, I've I've lived in downtown for a long time um, in a big metropolitan area. And um, one of the things that I appreciate is I feel like there's a lot of men in downtown and not I haven't experienced this in other areas of the city, but specifically downtown where they'll give me a compliment and they'll just say, hey, I just wanted to let you know you're really beautiful. Mm. I hope you have a great day. And they'll just keep walking. And it just lets me know that they understand the yeah. assignment. <laughs> some awareness. Is, there's me, some awareness, too. And it's really sad, where it's almost to the point of like, I might track you down if I'm attracted to you and say, wait a second, <laughs> you know? Yeah. That's the way, yeah. to, that's the way to do it. Um, so I think there's, I think, you know, because certainly like there have been times where I've met people on the street who were like, hey, I'm, I'm going to talk to you because I'm attracted to you. And I've mm -hmm. met some really cool people through that experience. Um, and so I, really? I don't want to... I really have. Yeah? I've dated oh, people man. that I've met just out in the wild. Um, I love that. Wild. I that is too. so wild. I think it's that is so wild. I'm <laughs> terrified to to approach women in public. I'm terrified for the really? reason that I'm because I'm hyper aware of your position, and mm -hmm. you, to be honest with you, are a little bit more trusting of yourself than I think most people are, and I, that's another whole component of this, right? It's like yes people can abuse that third energy dynamic they're creating in the cat call. It's like, you don't know yeah. where that's going to go. But I also yeah. think most people do not trust themselves well enough to handle situations that aren't perfect. 
right? It's like they don't like, you know, they, they kind of combust after that. And I'm brutally aware of it. And I know how I come off. Mm -hmm. I'm a big dude. And, you know, most people, when I just talk, they immediately like, you know, I have to really slow into it. I have to put my eyebrows up to not be stern looking. You know, I have to like do this whole, like I am innocent <laughs> and non-threatening as can be. And I, you know, I even don't even, I don't even project my voice much. I kind of keep a little higher and a little softer because if I come in like this right away. It, it's, you know, they get a little, little intense by it. So I, yeah, I'm terrified of going up to a woman in public unless I know for a fact that they're into it, which women also don't quite show that in public so readily either. Yeah, I think we're, I mean, I think part of it is that we're living in a very cell phone focused, app focused yeah. Yeah. world. So a lot of our social skills, like when you had no choice but to approach people in public, people did it more because that was just how you met people. Um, you didn't, you couldn't just, you know, go back on the apps later and be like, I hope I see them eventually on Bumble or Tinder so or true. whatever. So true. It's so true. So I think, you know, most of the people who've been in my life for a really long time that I've met, um, very few of them, I've met a lot of really great people on the apps, but I would say the people where it was like, you know, you just see somebody and you're like that, that's the thing. I really like yeah. that. <laughs> yeah. Um, and I love that you'll even go up to them too. I mean, do you, have you ever gone up to people or do you usually? Wait? Yeah, I actually, I have a story about this. So yeah. I was at a house party and um, it was a kind of wild house party. Um, it was actually this a porn kind stars of house, house party. party. That I've been to? No, no, no. One? This actually wasn't, but no, it wasn't. <laughs> um, this was not uh, that wild, but it was okay. it was quirky. So it was it was a, a friend of mine who's a porn star. Um, and you know, had a very specific niche uh of adult content that she was creating. And she had a very quirky group of friends, like just yeah. very across the board. So I roll in, you know, four or five people deep, like I always do. Really cool folks. And they're like, what yeah. did you just take us to, Jess? <laughs> oh, <laughs> Where wow. are we? Yeah, yeah, we were yeah. in the valley. Um, but she, for her birthday, had a burlesque show. And um, I just somehow managed to snag the massage chair right before the show started. And I was like right where they were dancing. So I was like, this is perfect. Uh -huh. And um, maybe a few minutes in, this couple walks in and they're gorgeous. Like just... Like, I just remember seeing them and I was like, this is the most beautiful couple I've ever seen. And they just had such a good vibe. She was a dancer, one of the burlesque dancers. So just beautiful. He was gorgeous. Um, so anyway, so after the show's done, I make my way over to their table because I'm like, well, you know, I'll go say hi. And I don't yeah. know what their deal is, but I'll just say hello. You gotta, you I, just gotta throw the I gamble was so out nervous. There. Totally. But I was so nervous because I was like, these people are so beautiful and I'm just going to come fumble. And you know me, I can talk to anybody. It's I normally don't get nervous. Um, but yeah, I approached this couple who was not actually a couple I found out later. Um, and that guy and I have been kind of involved for like seven ish oh, years. So I love that. You know, seven ish yeah. years. OK, so this yeah. is. I, you know, how do you do how do you do that? I can't. I have not successfully, yeah, like the way you're wired with the relationship is so fascinating to me. And that's another word that's interesting because I, I still don't even know how I feel about my own relationship to relationships, right? Interesting. And okay. I know, right? Um, <laughs> yeah. And you're, yeah, you're, you're, you're so much more fluid than I am with that. And, you know, I'm, yeah. I'm even going through stuff now with attachment styles, with people and stuff like that. And. Yeah, I'm, I'm having such a fun time continuing to discern how the hell I operate in intimacy. And you, you know, you, you found that side earlier for yourself. Well, you met me. Blew it open. Yeah, because I think you met me right when I was starting my journey into non-monogamy, right? Like really? that was, You know, it was I 2014. So. so I think that my ex-boyfriend and I at the time were on a break when you and I met. Um oh. It was like before I have, well, I mean, I didn't know it was a break at the time. It was one of those right. where uh, we ended up getting back together and opening our relationship. But I met really? you, I think, in between. Yeah. So I, I had no a five-year relationship. No kidding. Yeah. It seemed Did like you, you know were single. No, you were single as hell. Remember? We, yeah, we, for the people, we went on a, we went on a date and then we ended up kind of working together for a bit. And I know. 
I had no idea that this, I, did, I had no idea that you were on this break. I had no idea that there was someone else well, even I thought, going on. I thought I was single, to be fair. I really, yeah. I didn't think we were getting back together. No, I'm yes. not throwing you on the hot seat about that. I'm not throwing you on the hot seat about that. But I had no idea that you, yeah, that you were, okay, so you were in the, in the very beginning of who is now the Jess that I know. Yeah, it was, it was a really interesting time. I thought, you know, I've wanted to be non-monogamous since I can remember. Not because it... Yeah. I don't know. It just made sense. I, I just really like people and I I get bored easily, not because I don't love people or that they're boring, but I just I'm kind of a creature of novelty. I love meeting new people. Mm-hmm. I love being spontaneous and every time. But I'm also I, I was at the time a serial monogamous. So I got into these since like the fourth grade, I had a boyfriend in the fourth grade and then I just Whoa. had boyfriends forever. <laughs> and I um, just swung the other way real fast. Totally. I, I was like, no it. more trapping, no more trapping. No, no more. Um, but yeah, so you met me right at the beginning when I was figuring out what I wanted it to look like and how I wanted yeah. to, to feel in relationships. And um, I did everything wrong and, you know, well, that's how you find my- out what to do right. You know, yeah, that's true. You kind really of. go through the whole. <laughs> the no, you whole have to. That's the whole. List. That's the cool thing about polyamory or you mm-hmm. know non monogamy, is you know I I would not call myself either of those things, and yeah. at the same time I recognize how every person brings a new light to a different corner of your cave. So for me, it's uh, I had this I like component that. that yeah I have this component to me that does not, that resonates with, I think, the foundations of non-monogamy because Mm -hmm. I learned so much about myself and existence through every partner. And it, and I, I crave that. And to, you know, I'm not saying there's ever going to be a ceiling to that with one person, but there tends to be, you know, a very explosive, you know, initial, I don't know, expansion. And then it slows down, right? It's like, okay, Mm -hmm. these are the main things that this person is mirroring back to me. And it's not that it's going to stop necessarily, but the impact of it has slowed down. Yeah. So in that way, I, I kind of respect what is sought after in the non-monogamy world because you get that like hyper speed all the time. And <clears throat> I love that idea, but I don't know there's something that kind of keeps me from diving into that. And I think it's more like the sexual component of it than the energetic intimacy of it. Interesting. I, Tell me yeah. more about that, which like, just, is it maybe, insecurity maybe it's around a fear? No, I don't know if it's an insecurity is it's, I, I think if this were 1930 and we did not have, I guess the fear mongering culture around STDs, I would mm-hmm. be just, let's go and do it. You know, like I would be a little bit more, I will happily say that I am, fearful. I'm, I'll be shameless about it. I'm fearful of that kind of world. On top of that, mm-hmm. I'd say that's 49%. 51% of it for me is I will not get an erection if I don't have an energetic alignment with you. And my entire early 20s, mid 20s was riddled with the performance issues that led me to think there was something wrong with me because I was, mm. you know, I told you I was late to the game. So I thought like now that women are into me, I better get freaking busy. So I was in these situations where I would have issues because I was like, oh, this hot female wants to sleep with me. So mm. I better do it. And there, you know, despite the physical look, there was just something not there. And I would force myself to carry it out. And I would yes. have, you know, I would either that sounds get awful. Hard, but that's what that's I I can't tell you how many men I know go through that, you know? And uh, yeah. finally I realized like, oh, this is an energetic thing. I, you know, looks really don't have anything to do with it. And uh, yeah. yeah, that changed it a lot for me. So I, not that I have to, I don't have to force myself to do anything in, in the non-monogamy world, but I would say those two components are the big ones for me. It's the energetic connection and kind of the, the fear of everyone just kind of sleeping with everybody. And I know that's an immature way of looking at it, I know. But that's, like, I mean, it's, it's I have like a hard a time. It's not not true well, either. I feel like it's not not it's true. Not, it's not not true. I do want to dispel a myth, though. So people Please. in the non-monogamous community are actually better about STI 
just testing and communication than folks who are traditionally more monogamous because there's this assumption that if you're only sleeping with one person, then you're not getting STIs. And that's kind of totally. um, obviously people cheat and all the things. Um, so mm -hmm. I hear you about that, but I think that fear is why I get tested so regularly. And all of, all of the people have all the conversations all the time, um, yeah. which I don't find with people who are more monogamous. Um, but that's a valid fear. I mean, I think different people have different risk tolerances and like, you know, the best way to not get an STI is to not have sex or to have a closed relationship. So it's totally, totally makes sense. Um, and then I mean, for sure that. the energy, what? Like that. I hate that. That's, that's like, you know, I know abstinence is not the answer. Obviously. I mean, it is, it is an answer, but that kind of sucks. Well, and I, I think that there's, you know, there is like so much shame around STIs and, and stigma. And so I think the stigma often is more harmful in most cases. Obviously, there are certain um, STIs that are very serious that have very long lasting implications. Yes. Um, but I think the the stigma of it is just so much worse for most people than anything else. And so yeah. working through that shame is, is you know, because pleasure, it does come with risks and you can de-risk a lot, but there's still always going to be an element of risk for sure. And then I think the energetic thing that makes a ton of sense. Like I, I think, um, I'm a big believer. So one of the projects that I've been working on that I actually don't know if I've told you about, but I've been, I'm about three and a half years deep into it is a project called the bonding project. Um, hmm. and it's a test that asks people how they like to bond. And we tried to remove frameworks like polyamory and, non-monogamy and whatever and get into the nitty gritty of you know do you want to have sex with multiple people do you want to have sex with one person do you want to you know just all of these different things around different resources um because i think in non when people think of non-monogamy they almost always assume sex right and you yeah. said something really interesting which is the energy piece is not the problem sex specifically is where you're maybe less not like less open to multiple mm. partners, but yep. maybe you could have lots of intimate connections that are not sexual with multiple people. Um, and so I was for my own curiosity, cause I was, you know, I, again, we met during a time where um, it was right before my Tinder rampage. There was like, I think we met <laughs> and then like a Tinder year later. Rampage. Well, this is yeah. back when Tinder wasn't awful. 2014 was Tinder was not, was definitely better than, than anything these days, that's for sure. I, I hear not good things about it. I don't know. Could just be I, me. Who knows? I think it was it was just different. It was the wild, wild west. I think people were not as they were maybe more open to stuff, but I think the um <laughs> I definitely went through a period of time where it was yeah, I was I was really exploring all of my options once I Hell opened yeah. my relationship. Yeah. And um the uh the really common thing that I heard is that people will, would say, I'm looking for intimacy, but I don't want a relationship. I want a really strong connection, but I don't want a relationship. And in my mind, I was like, what does that mean? You don't want a relationship. And there's this thing in the non-monogamy world called the relationship escalator, which talks about there's this expectation of you start dating or sleeping with somebody, and then you start getting more serious. You move in, you call each other boyfriend, girlfriend, you get married, you have kids, blah, blah. And it's just, yeah. once I step on that escalator, I can't get off. Um, and so the option is either go on the escalator or just don't get on at all. Wow. It's but an what, all or nothing thing. Wow. Kind okay. of. Well, I mean, right. Because there's a lot of people who are like, if this isn't going anywhere, I don't yes. want to start. Yes. Right. That is correct. That is correct. So when people were saying, I want a relationship, like, but they were, you know, when they said I want intimacy, but not a relationship, it for me, I was trying to understand what does that actually mean? What are they trying to communicate that they maybe don't have the words to communicate? So I was interested in creating a test to be like, tell me more specifically what you mean when you say you don't want a relationship, because I don't, you know, to me, connection and intimacy can be really beautiful. And it doesn't mean that you have to want to get married and have kids. You can have a great friendship. Right. You can have a yeah. really great one night stand, like whatever it looks like. It doesn't have to be so serious. Um, so I think that's, uh, but I think we have more frameworks for this now. I think that people are talking a lot more openly about designing their relationships, creating different relationship yes. structures saying, Hey, you do this really great thing for me. And I love like this part of what we have, but I need these other things that you can't do for me. Oh. So how do we figure out how to fit that in? And that could be sex, but it could also be emotional intimacy or intellectual chemistry. There's or many different levels whatever. of intimacy. 
There's so many different yes. kinds. Yeah. I, uh, did I tell Way you about the, the sh- I know, I know. Did I tell you about the short uh, stint into the non-monogamy world that I tried doing with my in my last relationship? I think we Maybe. texted about it a little bit, but I want to hear a, a little, little bit. bit more about yeah, it. Yeah, yeah. Well, it's just everything you're saying is really bringing up. It's, it, it has no boundaries. It has no identity, really. Like what, you know, it's like that's such a human thing to want to put everything in a damn box. And, uh, yeah. you know, when I was with my in my last relationship, she had a very religious upbringing. So she was actually a virgin when we met, which terrified me, absolutely terrified me. Not yeah. not that she or it terrified me, but more like the pressure I unwarrantingly felt to hold her hands into the world of interpersonal sexuality. Yeah. And, you know, we, we, she was ready to go. She was ready to go. And I <laughs> wanted to wait. I was like, I'm not ready. And I kept delaying. It was maybe a month and a half into it, which. Can I ask why would, you weren't ready? Because I was still. I guess, obviously insecure in my own stance and my own place in the world of sexuality that I didn't feel that I was someone that could be leaned onto properly by someone that had never even been in this forest yet. I was not a master of this forest. So I, you know, I felt a lack of confidence in that. And, uh, yeah. And that just obviously that, right. And, uh, Early on, she and I spoke about not being in an open relationship, but being in a not closed one. We had a couple of wild experiences with plant medicine very early on that kind of, it gave us this knowing, at the time it was a knowing, that we were going to be doing this thing called life together until we were no longer here. And I was like, okay, I'm not going to be the only person that you ever sleep with, ever, on this planet, in this life. So I have learned so much from the people that I have been intimate with. It has been a crucial element of my own unfolding. I really want that for you. Secretly, I don't want to be the billboarded face of your (laughs) entire understanding of sexuality. I want you to know that the many, many, many moons of expansion and and self-reflection that come from sexuality aside of me. I can only show you so much. So I want you to have that other stuff. So, and you know, she intellectually understood that for someone who was going into her first relationship in, in its entirety, obviously her ego was like, oh, no, hell no. But we, we tried it and I kept, you know, I kept trying to even understand it myself. It was kind of like, okay, I gave her these, these two analogies and I, and I love these analogies. Tell me if they make sense because they made sense to me. Okay. <laughs> analogy <laughs> one, analogy one. It's like, imagine I'm this beautiful, you know, Bengal tiger in the woods, in the forests. And I, my territory is 20, is 20 miles, let's say. I never go beyond 20. Maybe I'll go 20 and a half, 21 miles, and I come back. But I have this kind of ingrained territory in my mind. Now, if you were to put a giant fence up on that 21st mile all around, even though I never go beyond that, if I were to go approach that and I were to see that giant fence that I never go beyond, I would feel incredibly caged. Mm-hmm. And I, so it wasn't that I am being, I don't want to say that I'm being propelled to go out. I don't want to. But if you suddenly put a cage to prevent me from doing something that I may not even want to do in the first place, I'm not even pursuing that, I'm going to feel like you're trying to contain yeah. it. So she understood that. Does that, does that, does that one make sense to you? Yeah. I mean, I I think it's knowing that you have the option if you ever want it. If you want to explore past the 21 mile marker, that you can take that step. It's not And that I would come right back. It's not really, I'm not going to just like leave forever. Like I don't, I have no intention or desire to do that. Right. Okay. So analogy number two kind of expands on that. She and I are the planet, right? We're the planet. All these experiences that give flavor and typography to the planet, they're just like the trees. They're not the planet. Like you and I are the planet. So this comparison thing, right? Because that was kind of the bigger thing. It was, is someone going to be better than her? Like, I'll be honest, the fear and the the lack of self-trust was not on my end. I was like, if she found someone that she thought was better for her than me, 
You know, like, what am I going to do? Hold you back? Right. Like that's, that doesn't make any sense to me. Like that, that could even happen in the heart of monogamy. That's not, that's not something that, you know, is, uh, specific to, to non-monogamy. And she didn't, she was always worried because she was a little bit younger than me and I was her first. So this, this kind of clingy, this natural clinginess, this codependence was very much there. And she was very worried that I was going to find anybody that was a better fit because we, she and I were on very different ends of the experience of life. So, yeah. And I, and I, you know, that, that whole thing is like, if there is someone that's better than you, that's the fear of, of polyamory, I think too. Can you share a little bit about that? Is that, that lack yeah. of, that lack of container? It's like, everything's so free, you know? Well, I think that, um, So I love football players, which is hilarious because I grew up hating football because my dad liked to watch football more than he liked to hang out with me. Um, and then and I never really knew. football. What do you players like about football players? Well, let me tell you. Yeah. <laughs> um, let me tell you. So um, I've you know, I started I I my long term ex was a football player. And then there were several other men that I dated, not un intentionally, often didn't even know yeah. they were football players until we were more involved. But um Something I really appreciate about football is everybody has a very specific job. And if they do that job really well, everybody wins. And the joy mm -hmm. is in everybody winning together. Um, mm -hmm. And so I think there's this is really great, <laughs> painful process that happens when you really open up to non-monogamy, which is I have to release wanting to be the best person that my partner has been with that they, the hottest person they've been with, um, the coolest, all of these things. Um, because ultimately I want the people that I care about, that I love, whatever, to have great experiences. And I want to share that with them, but it yeah. means accepting that they're going to have great experiences that don't include me. That might be better than some of the things they've done with me. Um, and I think once you can release the ego from that, which is very hard and it's a constant so hard. practice. <laughs> so hard. It's like the hardest it is. part. Yeah. It is very hard. But, you know, it's also, I think it's really magical because then the intimacy comes in. I feel accepted and I feel like the people in my life really want me to have great experiences. They want me to feel cared for. They want me to feel sexy. They want me to feel all these things. Um, and to the point that they're even willing to say, I want you to go have that with somebody else that doesn't include me or that's really hot yeah. or, yeah. you know, whatever. Because, um, there's just, you know, and I think I'm really competitive. So I do like, I feel it deep in my, bo my bones, but I also think that you can, you can, I like that though, because the way that I then approach partnerships is I'm like, Hey, I'm seeing what my partners are getting. It's awesome. I got to yeah. step my game up, you know, <laughs> like oh. I have to be a great partner. <laughs> wow. I know. I love that. I love it. You know, yeah. right, you hit something and I, and I wanted to ask, is it, is that letting go of the ego, the, the ego that creates the, the cage that you want to put your partner in basically, is that something that fades through practice of something or the sheer experience of going in and out of relationship over time, because I, I'm, I'm like kind of getting there myself, hmm. but it's not because I've practiced non-monogamy, right? It's just, I've just, right. I've been in and come out of so many relationships I've seen. You've been that, a serial monogamist. You've done a lot of relationships just linearly. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. But yeah. I also see that everybody has like done something different for me. And I'm, you know, so I really understand that no one person is going to fill a full bucket. Like it just doesn't happen. Yeah. So it's a lot of pressure. Is that, it is a lot of pressure. So is there something that yeah. like, you know, someone can work on with that? Or is it just a process of expansion via natural, you know, natural living? Like, is that something you can work on? It absolutely is something you have to work on. I think for me, when I started my non-monogamy journey, the desire to do non-monogamy was for myself, right? I wanted to yeah. have other partners. I wanted to have these needs met. And of course, the hardest part is when your partner also is exploring those things and you're like, oh my God, that's, I know what the experience is like for me. It doesn't actually make me love my partner less, but it experiencing it on the other side, of course, is very painful. And you're like, what if they yeah. do leave me? What if they do all these things? And yeah. I think um, it is very, you know, 
spiritual, this idea of you can't really, you never really own a person. You don't, mm -hmm. you can't, you can be monogamous and married and you can still get divorced. People can still have affairs. That happens all the time, right? Yeah. Um, and so I think um, there's a quote, and I forget where I heard this, um, that it's really hard to break something that bends. And if you have a relationship that is more flexible, that does allow room for desire that is not contained within a very strict mm -hmm. box, um, I think it actually strengthens the, the intimacy because it's scary, right? Like when you're like, I'm going to go have sex with somebody else or I'm going to go um, travel with somebody else. And maybe it's even platonic, but I'm having these experiences that are giving me all kinds of dopamine yeah. and they're intimate. Knowing that you have a partner that you can then share that with and and be vulnerable to say, like, I had this stuff that was really great. And it's really scary to share that because... I think a lot of our instincts is to say, no, but you're still the best. You're still blah, blah, blah. And you kind of have to stop doing that and just say this, you are amazing. This is what I get yeah. from you. And this was also amazing. And, um, so what's that little know. point? Sorry. What's that? What's that moment? What's that? Like, oh, it's okay. Like, that's like the thing I'm trying to search for. And I think everyone who is wanting to liberate themselves from codependence in general, whether mm -hmm. it be, you know, relationally or whatever it is. I want to, uh, you want to find that moment of, of actual detachment that feels safe where I, mm. well, I'm with you because I want to be with you, not because I feel that I own you. And, you know, with this, what you're talking about, yeah, there's that moment. And that's the moment. I, that's the thing I'm trying to find. Well, but isn't it an interesting thing though? Because to me with non-monogamy, I trust that the people who are showing up in my life are choosing to be there. It's not yeah. because I've trapped them in a relationship. It's not because they don't have other options. Like they're very much encouraged to go explore other options. And so if yeah. they're showing up, I know it's very intentional. I know it's a choice. It's not out of obligation. Um, and that makes me feel more secure because I don't feel like, oh, they feel stuck or they feel whatever. Because I do think that a lot of people, when they feel like they have freedom, like you said, you gave the example of the tiger, right? And if you don't have the fence there, you might not even wander past that point, but just knowing yeah. there's a fence there, you're probably going to want to climb over it. Right. There's just always mm -hmm. going to be that, like, I feel stuck. What happens if I leave? And I think for a lot of folks, the more freedom they have, the more perceived freedom they have, the more invested they become in the partnership because they feel accepted because they, they feel safe. It yeah. does establish a more secure attachment. I do think, and this is kind of controversial, I've uh -oh. talked to a lot of couples who've opened up their relationships and a lot of people start with really strict rules and, you know, all these things. They, a lot of them start with don't ask, don't tell, whatever. Um, really? I don't the think. Don't ask, don't tell. That one's, that one seems not great. That's a starting it's not great. Point. Yeah, it's not great. I think honestly, a lot of the really strict rules are also not great because it's still, it's like, you can do these things, but I'm still going to build a fence around it. Right. And yes. You know, and it's for a lot of us, magic happens when you're not planning it. When we have a connection, like when we travel, right? And you meet somebody when you're traveling and you don't expect it, you're in a new country and you're you're just open to the world. And I yeah. I know for myself, yeah, that's been when I've met had some of the most magical encounters because I feel so open to new Liberated experiences. Liberated and free. And like, yeah. Yes. And so um if you went in with really strict rules about what you were allowed to do and not experience when you travel, you wouldn't be able to experience that magical stuff. And so the question is always, if, if the goal is for us to experience these magical things, then you kind of have to allow a frame, like build a framework that allows for magic. Yeah. Um, so it's hard. I think people have to plunge in and then just be willing to talk about it. Like be like, okay, like let's go try dating other people, maybe it's not dating. Maybe one partner really likes one night stands. Maybe another partner is like, I just have one person that I want to date and be in a more serious relationship with. Um, yeah. Different people want different things to kind of add to their existing partnerships. And I think um, like one of my partners I've also been involved with for seven years and she and I, wow. um, it was funny because she, you remember Shay, of course. You, I right? do. <laughs> yes. I do. I do. <laughs> um, and we met, she did not identify as queer yet. So that was really? a whole journey. Wow. No, she did not identify as queer. And I was wow. like, well, you know, I'm not going to rush her on her journey, but girl, you're, you're gay as <laughs> 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 Wow. <laughs> like, That's amazing. Um, 
but yeah, she didn't know she was queer. Um, so that was a whole journey, but you know, we both have dated so many other people throughout that, throughout that time. Yeah. And it's great because even though we've been doing this for seven years, we started this bonding project, pro you know, research project together. Mm -hmm. Um, and we still, she had a, she has a new, not new, he's been around now for two plus years. Um, but when he, she first that. started dating, yeah, nothing new about that. But at the time when it was new, it was really hard for me because she had only ever had really casual relationships. And then mm. all of a sudden I had somebody who was in her life who was very serious and it just hit a bunch of nerves for me that I wasn't anticipating. So it is a constant process. Like you kind of get yeah. into these rhythms and partnerships and then you have to be open to, oh, like they suddenly are getting needs met that I didn't realize I wasn't filling. And right. you kind of have to do the ego death all over again. <laughs> so right. it's a constant. No, that's really tough. That's yeah. tough. Um, you hit something <laughs> that was, that was, that struck me though, about um, the being, being, free to experience the magic of connection when it hits, which is the entire point of that, right? So when you put all these rules, yeah. it's the same energy of monogamy, right? It's the same energy of the very thing you were trying to experience outside yes. of that thing you are trying to experience outside of. So, and that was my whole thing too. So like I want to feel, even if it was completely platonic, I wanted to feel completely free to experience the energy of someone that mm -hmm. didn't have a penis between their legs without worrying if I was doing something bad. If I, oh, oh is my ex going to like me? You know, is my, my partner going to like this? You know, I didn't want to worry about that. And more than not, it's usually just a friendly thing, right? But that that deep yeah. grip of monogamy makes you feel that you don't even look at someone. It's like you're doing something wrong. So being able to have a situation where you can experience the magic of you know, just a random run in with someone in a different country. It's like, go experience that. Do what you must do. Yeah. You know, I, I totally get that. And I would never want to own someone and say, you can't go experience that. What a wild way to live. What a wild <laughs> way to live. So, in that way, I resonate deeply with Namna. But all have you heard about crap. relationship anarchy? The idea of yeah. relationship anarchy. Yeah. 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 And I and I and I get it. And I, I also here's the flip side of all that, which I'm curious about your thoughts on. A mm -hmm. lot of people seem to use polyamory and non-monogamy as a way to run away from exploring a deep connection of any one person. Because there could be so much and I and I there's almost someone lived with me up in Ventura. In, our, in the house that I lived with my ex. It was, it was a three bedroom house. She was someone that we met during our very short little, little stint. And she was a big proponent of it. But she was so uh, unanchored in herself that she attached on to as many people as possible to feel companionship and feel connected and feel connection in general because she had none of that herself. So it was very surface level for her, but she used relationship mm -hmm. anarchy to just like spread this wildly huge net as far as possible, but it was shallow as could be. I, I think that, that different people, yeah, a lot of thoughts on that. Um, I think yeah, I used to be one of those people. <laughs> okay. Um, yeah, especially, you know, when I was coming out of my long-term relationship Little with my shell. ex. Yeah. Yeah, it, I really was interested in learning what I liked. Um, mm -hmm. And a lot of that was a breadth of meeting so many different people who were so different from each other and from me and from my ex. And I didn't feel ready. And there were several people who really wanted to get deeper. And I was like, I'm still tasting the buffet. I haven't explored the full buffet of options. And I want to do that before I really invest time. Because, like, you know, there is, I I believe love is limitless, yada, yada, all that stuff. Mm -hmm. But time is not, right? Time is mm -hmm. something that we have. Um, there is a, a finite amount of it. We have a finite amount of resources, other resources, money, um, affection, like all the things. Right. And so I think um, 
you do have to choose how you're spending that time. And, and it, when you go deeper with somebody, even in a non-monogamous context, it means that the breadth gets smaller and the depth gets better, right? Mm -hmm. The benefit, I think, to being in this game, the non-monogamy game for a long time, I do have a lot of people that I started as breadth and then we just got deeper over time. So it started very casual. And then I kind of found my people that didn't really go away. <laughs> I would do yeah. weird stuff yeah. and they would keep coming back. Um, and then over time, they wanted, our, they our wanted more of that weird love from Jess. They wanted more of that weird they love. They did. And sometimes they would go and disappear into a monogamous relationship for two years and then they would resurface. You know, it was like this very wow. fluid, you know, experience. And, um, but every time they, when they've resurfaced, it's been really great to reconnect with them, but to have that depth of time where it's like, we've invested so much time in each other over the years. We've seen each other go through so many experiences over the years. So I do think there's this weird thing about breadth that happens where it starts and it feels very shallow. But then if those people kind of keep showing up and they keep showing up, you do build this, um, intimacy of time where I've just seen you go through so many stages of life and mm. it feels deeply intimate to know people and that like you, we haven't talked in a long time, but I was like, but we knew each other at a very important, yeah. I think, time in our lives for both of us that as soon as we say hi, it's just like, great. I'm just so happy to hear from James again. <laughs> no, absolutely. Um, absolutely. <laughs> so I don't know. I think, I do think people can run away. I think that that's natural. I mean, you could be monogamous and not have depth in a relationship. Um, and so I do think it's just a question of when you're getting to know people, is it just fun and sex and whatever? Or are you really trying mm -hmm. to get to know who they are and experience that? So but yeah. you're a very, well, you, you were really so good... deep. Go. Yeah. <laughs> no, well, I'm just, keep going. you were so, your keep depth going. is so, I feel <laughs> when you connect with people, you want to like eat their soul. Like you're like that level of depth with your connections. I don't know is what other way there could be. It is fair to say. It is fair. You're not yeah. the first you're obviously not the first person to say that, but you know, I'm trying to extract the juice of life, right? I don't know how else to live. And you know, that, that experience that I have with people is an experience I would be putting myself through with anything. It's, it's kind of, it's almost manic in a way. It's like, I just want the full, I want the full thing. And uh, yeah. yeah. And I, that like that is, I think a very crucial component to even, you know, uh, broadening this breadth that you're talking about. Cause you can't possibly mm -hmm. do that unless you do that with yourself first. And, mm -hmm. you know, I'm, I'm hearing what you're saying and I'm, you know, comparing that to this, this gal who lived with us and sh she didn't have that depth to herself. So she quite obviously could not experience that depth with people because she, you know, what's the saying? Like you can only, you know, go as deep with someone else as you can with yourself. Like what is, I don't know. Yeah. But that is such a thing. And, uh, yeah, in that way, it's like I don't even know if I have the bandwidth to explore this kind of multi-person thing because mm. I it would be a full-time freaking job for me. <laughs> it's hard enough with That's one fair. person, you know. It's hard yeah. enough with one person. So, you know, I, I'm in this this fun little little axis experience with life right now, professionally and you know, romantically. It's like. I want that romance. I want that partnership. I don't really have any time for it because I'm in this really cool professional expansion era. I'm in my professional expansion era. Uh, but I, yeah, I also want this other side and there's no space for it right now. And I kind of struggle with that because I, I've never been this busy, which is a blessing in itself. But yeah, I'm trying to figure out this little this little thing. Is it, the deep dive is the only way to do it. I, I don't know if I could do a half ass thing. So how do you define romance? What is what does that look like to you? Because it sounds all consuming in this very. But I'm just curious when been. you think of romance, how been. do you define it? Yeah, I'm 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 loosening my perspective of it, and I've had to <laughs> okay. because I am typically someone that fully dives in so much to the point where not nothing else matters. It's like I'll do my other things, but I just I'm less interested in the other stuff. I become so um, so much of a student of this person and so much of a student of our dynamic that I just, you know, it becomes like a new instrument. It becomes like a new creative outlet. Like this person, this, this dynamic I'm in is something I just want to, it's a cave I want to fully explore. 
right? I become this explorer. And as fun as that is, it does not leave room for a lot of other stuff. And I found that yeah. in my last partnership, it was the most that I've ever experienced. It was so cosmic and spiritual and it was amazing, but I didn't do shit for my professional life for like a year and a half. Even though I was kind yeah. of trying, it just kept getting pulled in, back into this whirlwind that I had created with this person that it didn't, I, I quite literally didn't have the energy to even do any of my, my other stuff. And, you know, that was maybe an extreme case, but I want a little bit more, uh, I don't want to say slowness, but I want a little bit more like groundedness and, you know, it, for it to almost feel more platonic in a way. You know what I mean, mm -hmm. and not not so aggressive, and I'm and I'm running into that a little bit with with some people now who are who are interested, and I'm like I'm I want this to be a little bit more of an exploration of emotional and energetic intimacy before anything else, because second I dive in, it, it is it. Yeah, and this is this is the cool part. This is the new thing I have not experienced until now. I have a really she's probably my best friend out here now. Her name is Jules. We actually matched on Bumble. Uh, Amazing. Maybe six I love months ago, seven you. months ago. Yeah. And it's just, <laughs> and we, you know, we went on like two dates and it just became clear, at least for me, you know, whatever. I, uh, she's a beautiful woman. I, I think she's great. I just felt a more friendly brother, sister vibe between us. And mm -hmm. I was, I think we should be friends. And this is the first woman who has agreed to that after we had maybe, you know, at least thought to be more and okay. uh it's been amazing it's been amazing because i've had other other women who have maybe liked that idea but couldn't do it and i you know and, and these were and those were friendships that were actually so the connections that were so cool and they just yeah i'm really like what a bummer what a bummer <laughs> you know what i mean and this yeah. so this is a new thing it's like we're almost kind of dating without dating you know like i've never had a female be this close with me that isn't more. well maybe you're maybe you're actually dating the real way uh, what does that even mean don't well, don't say that too don't loud know. don't say that don't put that out there <laughs> i just what do you i mean? just mean it in this what do you mean? okay so what do you mean so i'm going to tell you i'm going to tell you what my definition of romance is cuz i think this might resonate with you a little bit this is my mm. favorite dinner party question by the way cuz the answers you get what people think of as romance is really varying and broad um, so I'm, I find friendship deeply romantic to me. That is the most romantic thing in the world because with friends, I feel like I can just hang out and be myself and talk about deep things and feel seen and be able to laugh and be able to cry and do all these really intimate things without feeling like I'm putting on a show. And I think totally. a lot of traditional ideas of romance are very performative. It's very, um, you're caught up in the moment. You can't control yourself. And I don't find that to be sustainable or particularly sexy. Like it, it stresses me out because it's like, yeah. oh, I don't trust that. You know, I, yeah. it's fun and it's great to experience, but it's sort of like doing drugs. You're like, can I actually do this d every day and function? No, of course you can't. You can't no. be high all the time and like be, well, I mean, some people can maybe, but I, can. um, I just, I can't, I certainly can't. Yeah. No. Um, and so I think like friendship to me is the older I get, the more I believe that friendship is the foundation of romance, um, which is not how I felt when I was younger. I think I was, I was like, I have to have passion. I have to, you know, they have to m turn my world upside down for that to be real. And I just, after doing that a couple of times, mm -hmm. it felt so unsustainable and also, um, it's really hard to, you know, again, it's, it's something that breaks. I find that like that idea of romance is something that burns out, you know, it's so strong and so intense that it's really hard to stay close afterwards. Um, yeah. So I'm that's, excited that's what's for happened you. With this me. is great. Yeah. <laughs> no, it's, it'll probably be the first female that I will be lifelong friends, like lifelong connections with. You know what I mean? It's well, not, you know, not, I mean, you, me too, but you know, I don't, I, I see this person almost, you know, twice a week every day so there's a little yeah brilliant. you know there is more it's more than you know which is unfortunate we absolutely should be hanging out um so wait can i can i ask I also, sorry yeah. jules if you're watching this Go. are you 
Which, she have you will guys be. had sex? Yeah, great. No, we we no and we we made out once on our second hang, and that was. And it. would you would you have sex? And if not, why? Oh wow! Would You're it feel on the hot seat? You I know. know. Sorry. I, you know, I, I I'm not gonna be a weird human. I I can almost guarantee she's thought about it too. It's like sure, you can't not put yourself in the what if situation, and mm-hmm. uh, I yeah, it's not. It's been imagined, but not in a like I you know I need that way. It's been a in the same way where I you know imagine like, am I gay? Like I put myself in a mental situation and like would I like that? It's it's the whole like yeah. okay like I'm almost just curious what my emotional response would be thinking of myself in that position. I really love hers and my dynamic right now, and you know I was curious about your uh, response to it being romance. It's I use the word romance i use the word intimacy like we have a deep mm-hmm. intimacy and as we said there's many different kinds of that and ours is in a couple buckets and it, it isn't sexual so like we have i would say it's even sensual in a way because we both kind of understand how the world works in the same way like that's a very sensual mm-hmm. understanding and yeah. we share that so in a you know you know in a way i could see getting that deep it's just not sexual and do you I think, think I really, do you, think you can have romance without sex? I I think you and I are, are using two different words to describe the same thing. Like, I don't know. I don't, yeah. unless I just need to broaden how I view romance because I well, just but, keep thinking this intimacy. Is, this is the thing. When you ask 10 people how they define romance, the mm-hmm. answers are so broad. Because totally. some people think of it as like flowers. Other people think of it as magical moments with strangers. Like it's it's amazingly broad. So I'm curious for you, like when you think of romance, like is your definition of romance normally tied to sex? So it's like this feels platonic, but you know what I mean? Like is that because what no, you're describing you. to me feels very romantic, but I'm like, maybe that's not how you think of romance. I yeah, I guess I do tie it to anything that would include a sexual component. Otherwise, like I can be intimately platonic with you and that can be like a deep eros and not yeah. have any anything to do with sexuality, right? So or whatever yeah. one is like like a like a family love. I forgot the three what they're called. Um no, I, I love that. That's a great question. It's a great question. <laughs> I yeah, I haven't really thought of a way to yeah, when I think of romance, I definitely think of it leading to a sexual component. Absolutely. What do most people think? Do most people it's, think it's honestly, tied to sexuality? It, is so, it, it totally varies. It varies with age. Yeah. This is something I ask at every dinner party I'm at. It's really, it's a great, you just have everybody go around. My grandma, for example, yeah. my grandma is 92. <laughs> um, a couple of Thanksgivings ago, I asked her what romance is to her. And she said, playing the violin. She said she mm. doesn't feel like she can be romantic with another person, but she feels romantic when she's playing her instrument because she can express herself Whoa. freely. As a 90 year old right. or like that's her whole life? No, no, like her, her whole life. She's whole life. Her whole, and, and even wow. like her and my granddad had a wonderful partnership and a wonderful marriage, but I never saw their marriage as particularly romantic in the, you know, stereotypical sense of yeah, like yeah, lots yeah. of sexual connection and whatever. Um, And she certainly never described it that way. It felt like they were great friends who had shared goals and they had a great partnership. Um, And when she said that, she's a violin, professional violinist, and it made so much sense. I was like, of course, that's how that's Mm. how you experience romance, because romance is so personal. It's it can be something that is shared. But I think the way that we receive and give romance is very different. Um, Totally. And so I think it varies. I think it really, you know. The older I get, the more I see romance and friendships because I think, um, you know, it basically is. No, I, I now that I'm thinking, I mean, it basically is <laughs> romance. It's just it just doesn't have this one part. So I now I've just never thought to even think that it would be, you know, I, I, I guess I've just been thinking intimacy as romance and that intimacy has many faces. So. Yeah. Has anyone ever in, in, had that kind of be an answer? Um, when you ask which that? part? That intimacy is? That intimacy is like how you're describing romance is how I describe intimacy. And it can come yeah, in sure. many different, you know, many different flavors. Yeah. For sure. I think, I think, um, 
you know, I've, I've definitely met people who view friendship as romance the way that I do. And then there's a lot of people who it's, it's not quite friendship. There's still this sort of, there's this chemistry and this feeling that is a step above yeah. friendship. Um, and I think, but again, that doesn't necessarily have to involve sex. Like you could still feel romantic and not have sex be involved at all, potentially. And just hearing the way you're talking about this person is really fun because it's like, oh my gosh, I met this amazing person. I feel like I can be myself. And you're clearly excited mm -hmm. about it. And it's just, um, that's just really fun to see like, where does that fall on the intimacy romance spectrum? Yeah. And if you're not, yeah. Hi, Jules. It's also. so fluid. It's great to meet I you. I know, right? I love it. <laughs> she's gonna, she's gonna, we're probably gonna listen and watch this. She's gonna watch this on I our love. drive to a hike that we do on weekends. And she's gonna be looking at me like I'm a freaking nut. And she's gonna love you. <laughs> yeah. She's gonna love you. It's great. It's great. It's Thanks for tuning in to another amazing episode of North of Chaos. If you loved it, and I'm sure you did, please give it a thumbs up, share it with your friends, subscribe to the channel, and ring that notification bell. You can also find links to all of our social media platforms down in the description below. Make sure you follow us on Instagram, Twitter, TikTok, and Facebook so you never miss an episode. We're all on this wild adventure together, and I'd love to hear your thoughts on the episode. So drop a comment or a question in the comment section, and we'll keep this conversation going. So stay tuned for next week's episode. We launch one each and every week. So until then, stay weird and embrace the chaos.